it's, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Antonio Lay from the University of Ottawa, and he'll be speaking about uh, Iwasawa theory of isogeny graphs with level structures. Thank you for the introduction, and also thank you for inviting me to speak here. So for those of you who uh, know me, you would know that I'm not a graph theorist by training. So, uh, so this is kind of a new uh, topic for me as well. So, um, but I, I find it really fascinating how some of the techniques in, and calculations in, in Iwasawa theory can be uh, extended to this new setting. So I personally find it really exciting. So I want to share this story with you. Um, so since this is a, a number theory seminar, uh, I don't expect everyone to have a background in graph theory. So, uh, so here's oops, right? yeah. So here's the um, plan of my talk. I will first of all review some of the basic notions in graph coverings, and then I will tell you about some of the recent results on general USL theory for graph coverings, and then I'll tell you how the uh, isogeny graphs with level structures that uh, I define can be um, studied using uh, USR theory of graph coverings. And then at the end, I will tell you uh, something about a volcano. Uh, so these are some special graph uh, that looks like a volcano and they are related to the isogeny graphs that I want to uh, tell you about. Okay, so let me begin by uh, graph covering. So just some, um, basic notions. So uh, throughout the talk, uh, when I have a graph, I write a V of X for the set of uh, vertices and body of X for the set of uh, edges. So the reason I write body is because I will have elliptic curves uh, later on in the talk. So that's why I use uh, body E here. And in my graphs, I will allow uh, multiple edges and loops and also, um, for most of the time, my graphs will be directed graphs, so they have uh, directions as well. Um, so when I have a graph covering, that means I would have a, a map from one graph Y to another graph X. And if D is an integer, uh, I say that this covering is D-sheeted if for each vertex uh, in X, uh, the fiber in Y has D element, so each a uh, vertex in, in X would have D pre-images in Y. And uh, we have the uh, concept of DAC transformations. So that's the group of graph automorphisms from Y to Y, um, such that uh, when you compose your uh, transformation with the projection, uh, it's the same as projecting uh, your, your original uh, graph. So you can think of it like the uh, field uh, automorphisms for an extension where you are looking at few automorphisms uh, of an extension that fixes the point uh, downstairs. And uh, if I give you a D-sheeted covering, we say that uh, it is Galois if the uh, size of the DAX transformation group is D. So again, uh, it's a bit like when you look at uh, Galois extensions of field, you're asking for the number of automorphisms uh, is the same as the degree of the extension. And uh, when you have a Galois covering, uh, then we say that this uh, group of DAX transformation is the Galois group of the uh, covering. And then we would write gal y over x uh, for the group of DAX transformations. And uh, there is a fundamental theorem for graph theory as well. So uh, it's a bit like, again, uh, what we have for field. So if you have a Galois covering, then um, the uh, intermediate coverings uh, are in one one correspondence with the subgroups of the Galois group. So uh, there are a lot of analogy between the two, two theories. So um, most of the time, if you want your covering to be Galois, um, you would need uh, Y to be connected. So here's a really basic uh, example. So suppose your X is just a graph with one vertex without any edges. So you just have one vertex in the base graph and uh, you can look at a totally disconnected graph uh, upstairs. So you have N distinct uh, vertices. So that would be a covering uh, and it would be an N-sheeted cover 
And uh, the Dac transformation would be um, just SN. It would be the whole um, symmetric group on N elements, where you can just permute your, your vertices upstairs. Uh, so there would be too many Dac transformations. Uh, so yeah, unless N is equal to two, so that's a special case, but if N is greater than two, then you will have N factorial Dac transformation. So but that wouldn't give you something that is Galois. So, so just a basic example to, to illustrate why uh, having something connected is important, and that will come back later uh, during the talk why we want to have some uh, connected uh, graphs as well. So, so, so that's just a basic example. Uh, so some more definitions. So suppose uh, X is a finite and connected graph. Then you have these sets of zero devices uh, on X, so that's uh, would be some formal sum uh, on the vertices. And I would be interested in the zero devices. So that means I want the degree of the devices to be zero. So M of X would be the set of uh, Z-valued functions on the set of vertices. For each such function, uh, I can define what we call the principal divisors. So um, I won't give you the precise definition, but uh, if I have a function on the vertices, uh, depending on whether you have an edge going out or going in to that vertex, you can define a divisor. Um, so at each vertex, you will have a number depending on the value of the function and so on. So what is important for us is to know that uh, you can define uh, the Jacobian of the graph. So that's just the uh, set of zero devices, quotient by the set of principal devices. So this is a bit like the class groups uh, for number fields. And uh, what's interesting for, for us is that the size of the Jacobian has some uh, meaning. Uh, so if you look at the size of the Jacobian, it gives you the number of spanning trees of the graph. So you can think of it like a class number uh, in the setting of number fields, but now we are working with graphs. Okay, so, um, so here's a theorem that I uh, learned about in the main uh, Quebec number theory conference uh, in 2019. So that was just before the pandemic. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, Jonathan Sands gave a talk in the conference. Uh, so uh, he explained that uh, you have the following result. So let's suppose you have an abelian Galois covering of finite connected graphs. So when I say, that uh, it is a abelian Galois covering. It just means that the Galois group is an abelian group. So here I, I say that the Galois group is G, so G is assumed to be uh, abelian. So uh, they proved that you can find a special element theta y over x. It, it is uh, an element in the group rank of G, so G is the Galois group of the um, uh, the Galois group of the covering. So I won't tell you exactly how this element is defined. It is defined using the RT and power L function of your covering. And uh, these elements, uh, you can think of it as some kind of uh, Stickelberger element in the setting of uh, fields extension. And uh, what they have proved in this theorem is that this uh, special element is in the ironator of the Jacobian of Y. And the Jacobian of Y is a G module. So the Galois group acts on the Jacobian. And so, so this result, um, you can think of it as the analogy of the Brumer conjecture in the setting of uh, class groups for a billion extensions of number fields. So when I saw this talk uh, by Jonathan Sands, I thought it was fascinating. Like. Uh, how, how they could prove such a result, uh, which is completely analogous to uh, the setting of number fields. So after the talk, I, I talked to Jonathan and said, wow, that's really exciting. Like, uh, you know, in USR theory, we are interested in a tower of extensions of number fields, not just one a billion extension. So I asked him, well, do you know whether something uh, like a USR theory for graph covering could be possible? Can someone develop such a theory? So he said, well, he doesn't know, uh, but he said, um, you know, that some people are thinking about these questions. So he said he would keep me informed if there are any uh, news. So 
Um, and, and, uh, and, and so a few months later, the pandemic hit. And then uh, during the pandemic, I received a message from Jonathan as he promised. He said, oh, by the way, I, I know that some people have uh, been able to prove uh, some results uh, in this direction. And I said, wow, that's so exciting. So, so that's the next uh, topic that I want to uh, tell you about. So what, what can you do with um, U.S. server theory of graph coverings? So uh, before I tell you the results, so let me uh, tell you what is a ZP tower of graph covering. So P will be a fixed prime number. So um, a ZP tower would be a chain of um, graph covering denoted by x1, x2, xn, da, da, da. So I want each graph xn to be finite and connected. And I want the covering from xn to x to be Galois. And uh, I also want that the Galois group of this covering to be isomorphic to the cyclic group of uh, order p to the n. So when you take the inverse limit of these Galois groups, it will be isomorphic to ZP, the periodic integers. So again, this is analogous to what you would do in the setting of uh, number fields. So that's what it looks like a ZP tower of number fields. So uh, with this tower, what can you do? So this is a theorem by um, Daniel Vallier, uh, McGann and Vallier, and also by uh, Gonet. So they proved this result in different settings under uh, different hypotheses and using different techniques. Uh, but they all proved that um, just like a ZP tower of number fields, you know how when you look at the P part of the class group in a ZP tower, you can find mu, lambda, and nu such that the P part of the class group is equal to mu times P to the n plus lambda times n plus nu when n is sufficiently large. So they proved a completely analogous result in the setting of graph covering. So um, I so so when Daniel sent me this preprint, I thought, wow, that's so amazing. And so uh, again, it was during the pandemic, right? So uh, you could just invite anyone in the world to to give a seminar um, for your university without uh, paying anything. So so I thought, well, Daniel, why why don't you give a talk for us at Lava? So I was at Lava at that time. So so he gave a really nice talk on on this uh, result, and then I I find it really fascinating. I wanted to learn more about this, and so uh, I guess the the best way to learn about new result is to uh, learn it with someone else. So I proposed to Daniel, why don't we try to collaborate and uh, see what else one can do? Because U.S. server theory is such a vast uh, subject. So there are so many things one can try to prove. So, um, so again, during the pandemic, we uh, came up with uh, the following theorem. So instead of looking at the P part of the Jacobian, we look at the L part of the Jacobian. So here, um, L is uh, prime different from P. And uh, what we could prove is that if you look at the L part of the Jacobian of Xn, then uh, you will have this formula. It's given by some mu times P to the N plus nu, when N is sufficiently large. So again, you can recognize that this formula looks really similar to what, uh, what you get when you have a tower of uh, number fields, uh, giving you a ZP tower of number fields. So, so yeah, so uh, I want to explain to you how are uh, these uh, theorems proved. So in order to explain the main ideas, I need to introduce a little bit more uh, machinery from graph theory. So this is called voltage assignment. So voltage assignment, is uh, just a function. So if I give you a graph, I would- uh, Antonio, can I, oh, yes. can, I just, uh, can I just ask you to remind me, in the case when in number fields, when L is not P, mm -hmm. don't you get that the L part is bounded? If you look at the psychotomic uh, ZP extension, yes. Uh, 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 if you look at the uh, ZP extension, which is, which is not the psychotomic one, you can have a non-zero P, uh, mu, yeah. Ah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, 
And, and that, that's actually a very interesting question. I, uh, we don't know uh, what well, there's a, there, there are ways to, to show when mu is zero, uh, but it's not always zero. We can come up with uh, cases where we do have a positive mu. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. So let me tell you what a voltage assignment is. It's just a function on the set of edges with uh, values in some group G. G can be any group. Given such a voltage assignment, we uh, have what we call the divide graph. So what is that? Well, uh, the set of vertices of this graph is just the Cartesian product of the vertices of X with G. The set of edges is just the set of edges in X with G. So again, it's just a Cartesian product. So you should tell me what these edges do. So uh, what it does is the following. So suppose I have an edge in X linking S to T, then the pair E sigma will link S sigma to T sigma alpha E. So depending on what the voltage assignment on E is, your, your edge would be uh, shifted accordingly. So that gives you a new graph, a larger graph, and it is naturally a covering of the original graph because you have a natural projection just by forgetting about the, uh, the G part. And what is nice about this is that uh, if G is finite, and if both X and the derived graphs are connected, then this covering is Galois. And so that gives you a nice way to cook up with um, Galois covering. So uh, with this in mind, we can use it to uh, study our ZP towers. So here are the main ideas of the proofs. So suppose you have a ZP tower and um, what we, well, what Daniel and his collaborators have proved is that um, you can realize each of these Xn as a divide graph of some voltage assignment alpha n, where alpha n comes from a one single unique voltage assignment with zp values. So you start with a voltage assignment taking values in zp, and then you look at these uh, values modulo p to the n. That gives you a voltage assignment with values in z mod p to the n. Then each of these xn is one of these derived graphs. So that gives you a uniform way to study your tower. And uh, with this voltage assignment alpha, you can define what we call, well, this is my terminology. I don't think this is an official terminology, but I would call this a PNX zeta function, which is defined uh, using alpha and the adjacency matrix of X. I won't give you the technical definition, but just know that uh, it is really explicit, really hands-on. You can just write down the, the definition by hand. And then, um, you can think of it as the analog of uh, periodic zeta functions. So here I write it as a finite. So, so this is a sum indexed by zp. And uh, this is actually a finite sum. So lambda a would be 0 for almost all a. And then I take uh, I multiply lambda a by t to the a. t is just some, some indeterminate. And so uh, when a is a periodic number, you, there's a way to expand this as well if you want. Uh, becoming a power series. Uh, and so using this, you can compute the size of the Jacobian just by evaluating this uh, PLX data function at P power with sub unity. Um, so it's a bit like the uh, calculations in the number field setting. You have the analytic class number formula. You can uh, find the class number using some uh, PLX data function. Uh, so here, this is completely analogous. So once you have this, then you can um, mimic what you do in the number field setting. So when when you are looking at the p part, then you would uh, mimic what Iwasawa did. When you're looking at the l part, you can try to mimic what Sinat did in the number field setting. And it turns out that uh, these calculations can be uh, generalized in this new setting. So this is the idea. So um, the next thing I want to show you is just some picture because it is about graphs, so I should have some pictures. 
uh, just to illustrate um, some of the theory. So um, let's say S, uh, sorry, X is a bouquet. So what is that? It, a bouquet is just a graph with one vertex and some loops around this vertex. So here I have a bouquet with two loops. And then let's say P is equal to three and my voltage assignment would send the two loops to one and 11, just some random numbers. So once you have this information, then you can build a ZP tower. So this is what you would get just by uh, using the uh, definition of derived graphs. So that's really uh, nice. Um, and here's another example. Uh, if X is a dumbbell graph, so that means I have two vertices. There's one edge linking the two vertices. And then for each vertex, I have uh, two loops. Well, each vertex has one loop. So in total, I have two loops. Um, so if I, again, take P used to three and I look at these um, assignments, then you can draw the uh, derived graphs explicitly just by following the definition. So it's really pretty. Um, so one question uh, we wanted to understand is, okay, so since each ZP tower uh, is related to a voltage assignment, then um, there's a natural way to parameterize the ZP extensions or ZP towers. So we wanted to ask some statistical questions, a bit like what people do in arithmetic statistics. So you would, you might be interested in how number fields behave when you uh, look at a large family of number fields. So here we have a natural way to look at to parameterize these. Uh, ZP tower using voltage assignment. So uh, we study some statistical questions in this direction. So this is a result um, by myself uh, with Cetek de Jong, uh, Anne Fishwell, uh, Ray, and Daniel Vallier. So these are some basic uh, cases. We have uh, more cases in our paper, but I won't uh, give you all the details. So let's say X is a bouquet with T loops. Uh, you can just work out the p at x zeta function and then you realize that when t is equal to one, then mu is always zero and lambda is always one. So that's really simple. When t is equal to two and p is at least three, we can show that mu is always zero. Uh, we can also show that when p is three mod four, then lambda has to be one. And when p is one mod four, then you have two possibilities, either lambda is one or lambda is three and the probability is given by this formula. So again, yeah, so, so here I'm putting a hard measure on the ZP, uh, the, the periodic integers. So you can, yeah, you can give a probability of uh, each case. And then a, a little bit more complicated when uh, T is equal to three, you have uh, this probability. And, and then we have other formula. Uh, so, so far, um, it's all just ad hoc um, calculations. We don't really have a good uh, general method, but like if, if you give me a graph and then I look at all these ZP extensions, I can just look at the uh, periodic uh, zeta function and work out when will mu equal to something, when will lambda equal to something. So this is really explicit. So, um, so, so that's the general theory of USL theory of graph coverings. So after, after these uh, theorems, I asked myself, well, that's nice, um, but in the setting of number fields, we have a canonical ZP extension, which is the psychotomic ZP extension. In the setting of graphs, doesn't, there, there doesn't seem to be a natural candidate of uh, ZP graph covering. So, so, um, so I asked myself, what would be the interesting towers to, to, to study? Uh, so um, at that time, I already moved to Ottawa. I had a postdoc, uh, Katerina Mueller, who was uh, still in Laval. And uh, so she stayed behind when I left. So I, I felt sorry. And so I uh, invited her to come to uh, Ottawa for a couple of weeks. And so during those two weeks, we uh, talked to each other almost every day. 
and it turns out to be pretty uh, productive. Like when when we were both in Lapa, we would meet once a week, and then because I have a bad memory, so the next time we meet, I would have forgotten what we have done, and then I have to ask her to remind me what we did, and then and start again. So during those two weeks, I don't have that excuse. So like we were trying to come up with new ideas. And one thing we uh, realized was that um, there's a nice formula linking the um, uh, the Yehawa zeta function of an isogeny graph of super singular elliptic curves to the Hasselhoff uh, zeta function uh, for um, for the modular uh, curve over a finite field. So there's a nice link between two uh, worlds. So the idea was that, well, in Iwasawa theory, um, sometimes we would look at the tower of uh, modular curves by varying the level. So we thought, yeah, why don't we try to do that and see what we can get? So that's the next uh, topic that I want to um, tell you about. So. Um, yeah, so so we would be looking at so so yeah so for those of you who who know the area well, you would know that um, in cryptography, you, you, people uh, would work with isogeny graphs of um, super singular elliptic curves, and that's the first one we try to study. But then we realized that uh, it might not be so appropriate for what we wanted to shoot, wanted to do. So let me explain why. So. I would be looking at, first of all, elliptic curves defined over FP. Um, and then I would have a gamma one P to the N level structure. So this is kind of similar to what uh, people do in arithmetic geometry. When you look at a Ygusa tower of modular curves, that's the level, you can look at such a level structure. So let me explain what we uh, did. So here I will take two prime numbers L and P, they are distinct from each other. And I said FP, but you can look at uh, a finite extension of FP if you want. So K would be a finite field of characteristic P. So here's the graph we studied. So we defined XN to be the graph whose vertices are isomorphism classes of these pairs. So you have E and Q. So E is an ordinary elliptic curve over K, and Q would be a point on E with uh, order P to the N. So as you can see, if I want to have a non-trivial point of order P to the N, then uh, it has to be ordinary because if it is super singular, then you don't have such a point. Uh, so but for us, this seems like a really natural thing to look at because that corresponds to x1 p to the n, the modular curve with a gamma 1 p to the n level structure. And so here I insist that the curve is defined over k, but the uh, torsion point uh, can be defined over an extension of k. So these are the vertices. And then uh, the edges are given by the L isogenies, i.e. If I have two vertices, E, Q, and E prime, Q prime, then uh, whenever I have an L isogeny going from E to E prime, uh, and it sends Q to Q prime, then that corresponds to an edge between the uh, two vertices. So in the setting of uh, cryptography where people use uh, isogeny graphs to, to define a crypto system, this is similar to what they do, except that uh, they don't have the Q usually. They only have, um, they, they only look at uh, J invariants as vertices. And then they say that um, one vertex is linked to the other whenever you have an L isogeny. So here we are asking for something slightly more. And uh, by adding this uh, new level structure, then uh, it gives me, a tower of graph covering because from xn to xn minus one, I can just multiply my torsion points by p. Then, if q is of order p to the n, then p times q would be of order p to the n minus one. So that gives you a natural uh, graph covering. So, uh, 
if you look at this tower of uh, graph coverings, this is what uh, uh, we uh, try to study. So how do we study this um, tower? So uh, this is what we do. For each curve, I would fix a ZP basis for the Tate module. So the Tate module here would be of uh, rank one over ZP because uh, I am looking at a curve over a field of characteristic P. And so a detail module is of rank one, so you only have to fix one basis. Now, if you have an L isogeny going from E to E prime, since L is co prime to P, that would give me an isomorphism between the two Tate modules. So in other words, it would send the basis of uh, the Tate module of E to some multiple of the basis of the Tate module of E prime. So that gives me this constant alpha phi, depending on uh, phi and also the choice of basis. And this uh, would be a natural candidate for a voltage assignment. So um, for each edge, I have a element in ZP. So I can define this voltage assignment just by looking at uh, this uh, map between the taste modules. And just like before, if I look at this assignment modulo P to the N, that gives me uh, a voltage assignment with value in Z mod P to the N. And what we can prove is that the XN that I defined can be realized as the derived graph of this um, voltage assignment. So that now gives us a um, systematic way to study uh, our tower. So with this in mind, um, I can show you our first theorem in this direction. So uh, what we could prove is that the number of connected components of Xn was stabilized. So when you go up the tower, then uh, the number of connected components would uh, become constant when n is large enough. And if you have a good memory, um, I told you in the first part of the talk that if I want to have a Galois covering, usually I want my graphs to be connected. And so understanding how many connected components can arise would be important for what we want to do. And uh, once we know that, you can prove the following. So fix x0 prime to be a connected component of your base graph. And I assume that this uh, connected component has more than one vertex. So it's not just one single curve, but I have more than one curve in that connected component. So x0 doesn't have any level structure. It's just isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. And then, uh, now what we do is, when I climb up the tower, I would uh, recursively pick a pre-image of each of these connected components. So when I go from xn minus one to xn, I would fix one connected component at each step. And then uh, that gives me a natural tower of graph covering. And what we can prove is that if you go, high enough in that tower, these connected components would give you a ZP tower. So that's our first example of uh, a natural uh, ZP uh, tower of graph coverings that for us seems to be kind of canonical. Um, yeah, it, 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 I mean, I, I can't say whether it's a, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's still a really special case. I mean, uh, we, we are looking at a really specific graph and then uh, by looking at this natural tower, we can build a ZP tower from this. So we thought that's uh, interesting. So the second thing I want to tell you is that um, earlier, I said that um, I had to assume the level structure um, 
uh, yeah, I had to assume that the curves are ordinary in order to get a non-trivial level structure. But that's just because we were looking at uh, curves defined over a field of characteristic P. So the next thing we did was to look at elliptic curves defined over a field of characteristic difference from P. Then you have much more freedom because you will now have non-trivial uh, P-power torsion, whether it is ordinary or super singular. And in fact, you have even more because um, you, the, the, the Tate module is now of rank two. So that's the next thing we looked at. So we would be looking at uh, gamma P to the N level structure. And uh, so not just gamma one, but gamma P to the N. Uh, and we are looking at curves over uh, FQ where Q uh, is co-prime to P. So let me uh, give you the definition. So now I have to fix three primes, P, L, and R. There are three distinct prime numbers and Q would be a power of R. And just like before, I, for each N, I want to define a graph whose set of vertices are given by isomorphism classes of triples. So the triples contain three things. I have an elliptic curve E, which is defined over FQ, Q and R, they would be a basis of um, the P to the N torsion on my curve over the um, algebraic closure of FQ. So like I said, since Q does not, uh, Q is co-prime to P, then uh, I have now a module of rank two. So that's why I have a basis of two elements. So um, the edges are just like before. I would define uh, an, an edge between two uh, triple whenever there is an L isogeny linking one triple to the other. And again, this gives me a really natural graph covering just by multiplying the basis by P. Now, uh, for those of you who know something about non-commutative URSAVA theory, uh, would, would then uh, realize that that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do non-commutative Yuasawa theory for graph covering. Um, this is because I can um, realize this, uh, this tower of graphs using uh, a voltage assignment uh, on a non-commutative group. So let's, uh, okay, so, oh yeah, yeah, I wanted to give this comment as well, but uh, yeah, so, so whenever I have uh, two vertices on the same connected component, then that means the two curves are isogenous, so they should have the same reduction type. So that is also important for our results. So let me uh, put it out there. Okay, so yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, yeah, so that's the background. That's how we defined our graphs. So just like before, I can use voltage assignments to study this tower. So for each curve, E over FQ, now my Tate module is a rank two over ZP. So I will need to fix a basis of two elements for the Tate module. So let's say the basis is given by S, E, and T, E. Now, just like before, if I have a L isogeny between two curves, then that gives me uh, an isomorphism between the two Tate modules. So I can then uh, define this uh, matrix linking the two bases like this. So phi star would send my basis S, E, T, E to another basis of uh, the Tate module of E prime. So the two bases would be related by some um, GL2 ZP matrix. Um, and so just like before, we can show that uh, if you look at this, voltage assignments, ticking values in GL2 ZP, and then you just look at the values modulo P to the N, then uh, this alpha N will give me uh, the Y N. So if I look at the derived graph of this uh, voltage assignment alpha N, then I recover this Y N. So you can, again, use the 
um, machine of photosynthesis assignment to study this tower. So what can we prove once we have this photosynthesis assignment? Uh, so here's our theorem. Uh, so uh, just like before, I would first of all fix a connected component in the base graph. And once again, I assume that this base graph has more than one vertex. Just like before, uh, at each layer, I would pick uh, a connected component in the fiber. In, in theory, you can have more than one connected component in the fiber, but I just pick one of them. This is because I really want to have something that is Galois. So like I said in the beginning, uh, if I want my covering to be Galois, usually I need connectedness. So um, indeed, what we can show is that once you have picked this uh, tower of connected components as n go up, then you would get something that is Galois. And so the next question we study is then, what is the structure of these Galois groups? So I will look at the inverse limit of all these Galois groups. It would give me a Piedic Lie group. And it turns out that the structure of this group would depend on a few things. So let me explain that. So like I said earlier, the connected component comes with a reduction type, meaning that if I just look at one elliptic curve, if it is ordinary, then all the other curves in that connected component would also be ordinary. So let's say I'm looking at a connected component that comes from an ordinary curve. And uh, in that case, I look at how L behaves in the endomorphism ring of E. I tensor this endomorphism ring uh, by Q that gives me an imaginary quadratic field and I ask whether L is split or not in this field. If L is split, then this inverse limit of Galois group is an abelian Piedic Lie group of dimension two. If L is non-split in, in this uh, CN field, then uh, it would be a Piedic Lie group of dimension one is again abelian, so it's not too far from what we had before. So the most interesting thing that we have uh, found is that when the connected component comes from super singular elliptic curves, then this Piedic Lie group would be an open subgroup of GL2ZP. So that is really a non-commutative uh, Piedic Lie group. So uh, I, we thought that was really interesting how you can um, find a non-commutative tower this way, and then you can study uh, non-commutative URSL theory uh, for, for this tower. So um, that's our theorem. Uh, so at the end, I might make some comments on the URSL arming conjecture. Uh, but before I do that, I, I want to talk about volcanoes because uh, that's what I promised in, in my abstract. So I think I should uh, say something about that first. So uh, let me, uh, for the time being, just assume my elliptic curves uh, are all ordinary. And I assume L is split in, the, uh, in this imaginary quadratic field. Uh, there are other results in other settings, but I thought I would just give one setting and already that would give you a good idea of what can happen. So uh, this is an old result by Coel and also by Fouquet Morin. Uh, so um, if you look at the um, base graph, so remember, uh, if you just look at um, the isogeny graph, uh, without any level structure. So you can just think of each vertex as some J invariant. Um, so what they have proved is that uh, if you look at one of these connected components, then you get a volcano graph. So what is a volcano graph? Uh, so these are some examples. So what it is is that you would have a crater in the middle. The crater would be um, a cycle graph. 
And then uh, on each vertex of your uh, cycle, you would have um, some edges going down your volcano. Um, and so yeah, that's essentially what a volcano graph looks like. Uh, I mean, I can define it more formally, but uh, I think these pictures tell you what you need to know. So you always have a crater in the middle, and then you have the um, edges going down your, your volcano. Uh, so interestingly, uh, there's an inverse problem for these volcano graphs. It was a result by uh, Banbury, Campana, and Pazuki. What they have proved is that if I give you a volcano graph, then you can find infinitely many p such that uh, g is a connected component of the isogeny graph, uh, x is zero. So in other words, if I give you a volcano, then the, the volcano would be an isogeny graph. So here, x zero uh, is the graph, this is my base graph. So there's no uh, level structure, just the graph with elliptic curves. Uh, so what I want to tell you is that um, what happens right when you look at uh, the, the, the uh, graphs uh, upstairs? So if you look at Xn, what does it look like? Uh, so I only tell you the crater. So, so like earlier, you only have a cycle graph. So um, here we will have something more complicated. Why is that? Why, why do we have a graph that looks uh, so much more complicated? This is because um, earlier, um, they only have, they only look at elliptic curves between, um, sorry, they only look at isogenies between two elliptic curves. Um, and so, uh, okay, so um, I don't know what, if I uh, draw on the whiteboard here, can you see? But, yeah, I don't know how much you can see, but uh, so if you have E, and E prime, then you will have an isogeny going into this direction, let's say. And when you look at the dual isogeny, then you have an edge going into the opposite direction. So in the graph that I showed you, they would identify these two edges as one. So I was hiding a little bit of a detail. So, so the isogeny and the dual isogeny they are identified as one edge. But for us, we don't have this uh, phenomenon because of the level structure. So when you add this level structure, then you, you would actually get a new, so uh, you would actually get a new edge. The dual isogeny would give you another, you would still go from E prime to E, but you would send Q prime to some other torsion point. So that's why my graph becomes more complicated. And here I'm assuming L split. So you have, um, so, for, so over, uh, so, so for the two primes above L, uh, you will have uh, a, blue, a blue edge and a green edge, one corresponding to each of the prime above L. So, so that's why the graph looks like this. Um, but we can still describe it quite explicitly. It's just, uh, it just takes more care to describe what kind of cases you can get. And um, here's another example. You, you can have just one big cycle given by, given by the blue edges and then the green edges were just connecting different uh, vertices on the cycle. So it really depends on the order uh, of the um, of the isogenies. Like, how many times do you need to apply your isogeny to get back to the original um, point? So these are some more examples. And this is a really uh, complicated graph that we came up with, and we spent a lot of time uh, drawing this in our paper. So I I thought I should show it to you because. Uh, it, it took us hours to draw it, so I wanted to show off in front of you. Um, and so, so I think I'll just uh, conclude the talk with some final remarks. Uh, so one can actually solve an inverse problem for creators of isogeny graphs with level structures. So earlier I told you that if I give you a volcano graph, 
then you can come up with an isogeny graph that gives you that volcano. So um, we can do something similar uh, if you look at um, these kind of graphs that I showed you earlier. Uh, so something I didn't discuss is uh, oriented super singular elliptic curve. So this is something quite new, I think. Uh, instead of just looking at uh, super singular elliptic curves, you can um, add an orientation on the super singular elliptic curves, and then you can define an isogeny graph on these uh, curves. And we can also describe uh, these graphs using uh, something similar, and um, you can also add a level structure to the oriented super singular elliptic curves, and it can also give you a tower. And so uh, this is the results by Mueller and Clay. So they proved um, the U.S. warming conjecture uh, in the setting of graph covering under certain hypotheses. Um, so like I showed you, um, Earlier, you, you have a concept of periodic um, zeta function for a tower of uh, graph covering. And uh, so, so that's the analytic object. And algebraically, you can look at the Jacobian, just like class groups, you can take inverse limits of the Jacobian that gives you an algebraic object. So you can formulate a main conjecture linking the algebraic object to the analytic object. And they proved some results in this direction. Um, and there's also MGH conjecture, uh, which I won't go into. But for those of you who know about uh, non commutative URSL theory, uh, just know that a lot of the uh, uh, stuff we do in classical URSL theory can be uh, transposed into this new setting. Uh, and a lot of uh, analogies exist. So the final remark is that uh, my future goal. Uh, is that I hope that there might be some links between USL theory of graph coverings and USL theory of function fields. So I hinted earlier that um, you can link the uh, Yahawa zeta function of uh, isogeny graphs to the Hasselbe um, zeta function for modular curves over finite fields. So for me, it's really suggestive that the towers we construct, um, it might be related to the Yikosa tower that, uh, that was studied by um, Katz and Mazur. I, but I won't say much about that. I, I, I hope that there might be something to be explored, but I, I don't have anything to, to say at this point, but just know that uh, uh, there might be something one could do, but yeah, so. So I don't know, but uh, anyway, so I think I'll stop here. So uh, thank you for your attention.